So I thought um, it might be a good, it might be wise to start with both of your backgrounds before we um, jump into OpenAI and talk about OpenAI's history, um, its founding, and sort of um, its core mission. And then we'll also later talk about its current research um, sure. and the work you're doing in robotics, um, video games, as it turns out, and natural language processing. Yep, for sure. Uh, can everyone hear me? Raise your hand if you can't hear me. Um, so my background is, uh, uh, you know, I, I got into it. The, my first exposure to AI was actually reading Alan Turing's 1950 paper called Machine, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, which is the, the paper where he lays out the Turing test. And actually the thing that really excited me about this paper wasn't this amazing idea of that you could actually have a machine that could learn and that could, uh, that could perform tasks at, at the same level as a human, uh, but was actually this piece in there about how we're going to build such a machine. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Turing said is that we're never going to be able to program something so complex. So instead, we're going to have to learn. We're going to have to build a machine that we can show it data, show it the world, just like you would a human child. And then it's going to be able to learn to accomplish these tasks so well. And that idea, I think, really infected me. And uh, the only sad thing was this was 2008, and none of this technology actually existed. Nothing worked. And so I really spent you know, a bunch of time doing a bunch of startups. And you know, I, I was at Harvard briefly, MIT briefly, uh, before coming out to Silicon Valley. Uh, but was always kind of waiting for the time when it felt like this technology actually existed. Uh, and uh, yeah, Ilya is someone who, who actually really started to, to bring this to the forefront in 2012. Yeah, so in my case, I somehow, as a teenager. I think your mic. Oh, okay. yeah. Mic's not working? It's broken. OK. I'm Apologies. Going. An old-fashioned mic. <laughs> yeah, so I got into AI pretty early. I was very interested in math and brains and what am I? And I'm a computer. How can that be? That's very strange. So AI was very interesting. And within that, machine learning, learning specifically, was the really mysterious thing. Because in math, you got the logic, the deduction. But how can you know that the sun's going to rise tomorrow? What's the basis for that? So anyway, I concluded that machine learning is the single most interesting thing. And so I went to grad school. I was in Toronto. Fortunately, Jeff Hinton was in Toronto too. And we started working together. And I was working with him for um, nine years until we made the, our big advancement in 2012. Yeah. And um, so you both co-founded OpenAI. And OpenAI has attracted pretty impressive backers, like um, Reid Hoffman, for example. Um, and you know Peter Thiel and others. Um, so can you talk about um, sort of why you founded it then? I mean, what is, what is driving you forward? What is the thing um, uh, that you point to when somebody asks, why are you researching this? For sure, it's a great question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go first. I mean, for me, there were multiple motivations. Oops. Some kind of Amber Alert or Apologies. <laughs> yeah. So I had multiple motivations. I was, I was working at Google. I was very happy there, but I felt that I had multiple feelings. I felt that AI is going to be extremely impactful. I thought that AI, the, the, no, the notion of AI safety is important. And I thought that a new organization like OpenAI would have a chance to do a truly dramatic advance. And most importantly, I made Greg, and I thought that that this would, this would work. Right. And yeah. Greg, I thought um, I'd also like to hear you know, the answer to the question from you. And then also maybe like, you can touch on like, why um, you decided to found OpenAI as a nonprofit um, and sort of its recent transition to a cap profit, which is an unusual structure. Um, you know, two yeah. questions in one yeah. there. So in 2015, I, I, you know, almost, almost uh, I guess, uh, four years ago to the day, uh, we had a dinner uh, in, in Palo Alto, uh, and uh, the, you know, four people from, from that dinner ended up co-founding this company together. So that was the two of us, uh, Sam Altman and Elon Musk. And the thing that I think kind of brought us all together was a shared vision for where AI technology was going. Right? In 2012, Ilya and his collaborators had really kicked off the deep learning wave. And all of the AI progress that we've seen since then, which has been really amazing, really comes from this one piece of technology that had, had really come on the scene with, with that work. And the question of where, where does it go, you know, is kind of, it's limited by our imagination only, right? And you think about 
what could happen if we could really build systems that are able to work with people on solving the most complicated multidisciplinary challenges that humanity has to face today, for example, climate change, for example, giving everyone low cost, affordable health care. You could imagine that the impact of this technology would be like un, un, just completely unlike anything we've seen before. And so I guess that we all saw the upside, um, but there's also the flip side, if anything is going to be really powerful, is that you have to ask, well, what are the risks? How can this go wrong? How can we make sure that we're applying the right ethics and that we are building this technology in the right way? And so I think that this dual concern is what caused us to come together and form an organization. And you know that the main motivation for us is to try to build this technology, which we call artificial general intelligence, uh, and to make sure that it benefits the world, uh, and that that's what all the choices that we make as an organization end up funneling into. And so if you look at the history of the organization, we started as a nonprofit because we didn't really know what the best structure was to actually get the resources, get the people, and to, to really make the technological progress required to achieve the mission. Uh, and then we basically spent the next three years working on pushing forward the technology. We had a number of, of, of really exciting advances, but also trying to answer the question of how can we really get to not just the current level of technology, but really to build the first artificial general intelligence. And I think that the core of that ends up being computational power. Right? That if you look at all the advances over the past seven years, that they've been all fueled at their core by this massive increase in the amount of computation that they use. And actually, I think we have a slide that shows uh, the amount of, of compute over time. Uh, if we can put that, that slide up. It should be the, the, the slide. Yep. So this, this is a, a logarithmic plot. So it looks very linear, uh, but that actually means it's exponential. And so the amount of compute that's been going into these models has increased by about a factor of 10 each year since 2012. And that's a crazy thing, right? You know, like I think humans are really bad at internalizing exponentials. It's hard to really feel it. Um, so one way of, of, of thinking about this, it's a little bit it, just like if your cell phone battery, which today lasts for a day, five years later started to last for about 800 years. Uh, and then you, know, you went to sleep and you woke up five years later and now it's, it's lasting for like 100 million years. Right? That's the kind of increase that we're really talking about for the amount of brain power going into these systems. If only, um, yeah, my smartphone battery lasts about a day, um, if I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. right. Yep. It's a great analogy. Um, but yeah, so maybe you can talk about how, like what that's enabling, um, you know, some of the current work that you're doing as I mentioned in video games, in Dota 2, a popular MOBA, as I call it, it's a strategy, online strategy game. And, and sort of, I'm sorry, yep. <laughs> one little addendum to that. Um, maybe talk about like, the broader applicability of that sort of work. It's not necessarily um, you know, video games that you're trying to you know, master. Um, it builds toward this artificial general intelligence you mentioned a second ago. Yeah. So. One way to think about our work on video games is that it combined reinforcement learning with compute. So reinforcement learning, when it came on the deep learning stage in 2013 with the DeepMind Atari work, the games looked, it was exciting, but the games also looked simple. And it didn't really seem like reinforcement learning could do much. And so the way I like to think about our work with Dota is that we've shown that if you simply use a lot of scale with simple reinforcement learning, you can go a lot further than anyone at the time has thought. So now anyone will say, oh yeah, of course you can solve games, of course you can solve real-time strategy games. I mean, that's old news. But that's the way we just get accustomed to technology in the same way that we get accustomed to a new version of iOS two weeks after it's installed on our phones. And but yeah. And ju just to add to that, so the thing that I think is, is really important to understand is how this technology really works. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, that what the AI sees is just a big list of numbers. You know, as far as the human's concerned, there's a game with a bunch of characters running around that you know, this game is played professionally by uh, a, a large number of, of people that uh, live together in these gaming houses are very, very intense about this game. As far as the AI is concerned, it's just a big list of numbers. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that for other work we've done, the AI sees the exact same thing. It's just another list of numbers. And so you know, another 
work that, that we did last year was that we managed to have a controller for a robotic hand, which is something that no one had done before. People have spent 20 years trying to figure out how to program these robotic hands to, to perform any sort of meaningful task. And it's just too hard for human programmers. But using the exact same technology, using a system that just sees a big list of numbers and gets a reward whenever it tries things, we were able to both beat the world champions at a video game and also control this robot hand that no one had been able to do. And so this is the real core. This is the kind of technology that really sparks the imagination, that you think about what other problems can you turn into a list of numbers that are meaningful to a computer and uh, then allow it to figure out the strategy that is required to maximize reward. And the answer there is, is pretty limitless. Yeah, another one of those problems that um, you seem to be on the way to solving is um, uh, natural language, um, basically generating very convincing uh, snippets of Amazon product reviews, could have been read by human, some of them, um, or just, you know, uh, basically a small, uh, short novella. I mean, um, uh, you know, page long short story. Um, so can you talk about like GPT-2, this recent, you know, natural language model that you um, released um, and sort of like how it's similar and different from this, these other projects that you have ongoing? Yeah, I can, I can start. Uh, so what we did with GPT-2 was to take a large corpus of language and then take a very large neural network and then ask the neural network to learn to predict the next character. And we used a lot of GPUs and that's all we did. And it turns out that, so this is not a new thing. People have been training this kind of neural nets for a long time, but we made it bigger and we train it on a more interesting data set. And those two things led to what appeared to be a disproportionate advance in natural language processing and natural language generation. And I think that an interesting core here is that you know, we basically had been pushing on the same kind of paradigm for about two, two and a half years. And the first successes that we saw were with this, this paper called the sentiment neuron paper where we trained a neural net to play this exact same game. So you're given some text, you're asked to predict what comes next. You know, what would the human write next? And that we saw that when we had a model of a certain size, that the model actually learned a state-of-the-art sentiment analysis classifier inside of it. And this was a surprising thing, because we'd been asking this model to just predict what comes next. And so the obvious things it's going to learn is going to learn the spelling of words. It's going to learn where you put a space. It's going to learn where you put a, a period. It's going to learn these very detailed statistics. But this was the first time that anyone had seen semantics emerge. We hadn't told it anything about what these words meant, but somehow it found something that was meaningful. And here's the other crazy thing, is when we shrank the model by a factor of four, this effect totally went away. And so GPT-2 is just the scale up. You know, it's a slightly different architecture. There's different tricks in it. But fundamentally, it's a neural network that we scaled up. And suddenly, we start to see all sorts of, of really interesting behavior that it can actually write these essays that are actually pretty convincing. You know, it wrote this, this essay about why your cycling is bad for the world. And uh, you read it, and it's actually making this argument about, well, the problem is that we're actually generating all this waste in the first place. And so really, we should go, and we should be cutting, looking at the supply chain. And it's actually pretty convincing. Someone posted this on the, the recycling bin at, at OpenAI, you know, entirely written by, by, by a neural net. And uh, you know, when we read that, that, that essay, we were like, this has to be copied from somewhere on the internet because you know, that's how the model was trained. And we spent a long time really trying to find, it, find some, some forum posting where someone would say this kind of thing, and we couldn't find it. And so somehow, the neural net, and you know, maybe it's rephrasing things that other people said in ways that are more sophisticated than we were able to detect, but fundamentally was able to combine ideas and to come up with something that's actually quite convincing to us. Right, um, and that um, is sort of like a natural segue into the explainability piece of your work. Um, so you know, it's great to have like this really capable model that um, you know can generate any sort of text you might want <laughs> or or understand any text you feed it. Um, but how does it work? Right, that's something a lot of people would want to know. Um, and that you're not only doing explainability work in natural language processing, you're also um, you've made significant advances in uh, explainability with respect to computer vision. So maybe you can talk about like uh, Activation Atlases, this recent project you detailed in a blog post about um, you know, your approach uh, to model 
training um, that allows people to see you know, which parts of the neural network are uh, inferring things about the data set on which the network was trained. Yeah, so explainability in neural networks is an extremely important question because as neural networks get smarter, we want them to do more things and sometimes they'll make decisions or predictions and we, it would be preferable to understand why they made a particular prediction. And these, new, these neural nets are being so large that it seems that it could be challenging to understand what they meant. And so with our ex work on explainability in vision models, we've done work where we've been able to understand the essence, that a single, the essence of a single neuron. What is it that a single neuron is looking for? And we've been able to extract those compact, concise circuit diagrams that explain how the recognition of an image is assembled in a human understandable form. And but what I would expect to see longer term as this work advances is that we'll apply similar tools to language models and models in other domains as well. And ultimately, when we, com when we have a model that's uh, we will use the model's language abilities to explain to us why it made a decision. Mm -hmm. And that will be very useful because then it will tell us, I made decision X for reason Y. So now you know. And I think this is very exciting because there's really this myth that neural nets are a black box. They give us some answer, totally un understandable where it came from. Which, if you think about how humans work, this isn't actually that much better than, than, than we are, right? You can ask someone why they made some decision, but when you actually do the psychology research, you often find that they made the decision for some totally unrelated reason. Um, but I think we can do better with neural nets, and we're, we're really seeing the evidence that we can. And so, you know, again, really the hope is that as we start to have AI be more, you know, entrusted with important tasks in society, that we can understand why is it making the decisions that it is, that we can ensure that it's actually going to do what we think it's going to do, uh, and that we can then ensure that it's actually going to be used to benefit people. And so I think this kind of work is really important. Um, but there's actually a second reason that I think that this work is, is really important, which is, uh, is actually a collaboration with Google. Um, and I think that one of the things that's really important as you bring transformative technology on the scene is that you have cooperation on these axes of ensuring that it's safe. Right? It's good for everyone if car manufacturers coordinate on, on seatbelts. Um, and I think it's kind of good for everyone if, if everyone developing AI coordinates on safety. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I think it's maybe important to mention, and you have uh, detailed it in blog posts previously, but um, uh, that when you released your GPT-2 work, um, you decided not to um, publish uh, the model that is most capable, that we've been talking about the model ca you know, that can generate this convincingly human-like text. Um, and you said you were worried about how it might be abused. Um, so do you think once the explainability piece is there, um, and you know, you're uh, working with these models that can basically um, you know, tell anyone who's using them why they made the decision they made, you'll no longer have to be as concerned about that as you are now? Yeah, so I think the GPT-2 release is, is a really interesting case study. Um, because, you know, from, from just kind of where it really started from is that we created a model with capabilities that really surprised us. And that it was hard for us to assess, what's this going to be used for? Where are the limits of it? And, you know, we kind of look at it, we looked at it, we had an internal process where a bunch of people in the company uh, uh, were involved. And the conclusion from this was, there's a bunch of arguments for why it's totally fine and you know, it's just kind of the incremental progress from, uh, from you know, what people have been doing. There were other arguments for, well, you could imagine this being used to write fake news. And we didn't really try to go and like, write the best fake news with it to make sure that, in fact, you could write awesome fake news. But it really felt within the, the, the sphere of possibility. Um, but I think that the argument that really tipped it for us was that it's kind of a question for GPT-2. You can make reasonable arguments in both directions. But what is so clear is that as this technology progresses, because remember, this was just a scale up of previous technology, we're going to have models where it's super clear that they have dual use implications. They can have amazing applications and do great things, but only if they're used in the right way and that they also could then be used for things that aren't so good. And that as a community, I think that what's clearly missing is an answer for what you do when you have a model of such form. And you really don't want to be figuring this out when you have the super scary thing. 
right? You really need to have a dry run. You need to have some test run where if you mess it up, if you accidentally leak the model, if someone gets angry and tries to reproduce it, that it won't have catastrophic effects. And so it was really important to us that we raised a flag for, hey, we have to develop a norm for how you cannot share. And actually, you know, I think we're extremely happy with the results. Right, that, you know, we've seen, you know, there was there was a bunch of controversy, which you know I think is is unfortunate, and like you know we would have preferred not to have that, um, but I think it was really necessary for the first time that someone said, hey, we have something we're not sure about, to have that kind of reaction to let people really you know let their emotions out, and uh, I think that we learned a lot from it, and you know what we've seen since then is we've seen uh, several uh, different groups either try to replicate it or replicate it, uh, and also come to a similar conclusion of, let's hold this back for now. We're working with partners now uh, in order to really study the, the, the capabilities and figure out how can you actually use this for fake news mitigation. Uh, and I think that, that these kinds of efforts are really important. And I hope that they're going to set really good precedent for what happens the next time someone has a model like this. Yeah, and just to add to that, it really boils down to machine learning is becoming more capable. And that's it. The more capable it is, the more ways, the more are the good ways, but also the bad ways in which it can be used. And so it just gets less clear. Right, um, so you said um, there have been a lot of learnings from this release. Um, do you think, I mean, it's difficult to project, but do you think you might approach, once you develop a model like this, probably, you know, which presumably will happen eventually in the future, um, another highly capable model, maybe a computer vision model or uh, you know, a model in some other subfield of AI, you will you know, consider holding it back um, until you can develop safeguards around it. Um, you know. Well, I think it's, it's not really about us in some ways. It's really about community norms. And if you look at the security community, it took them a long time to figure out responsible disclosure. Right? So responsible disclosure, for those who aren't familiar, is the idea that if you have a vulnerability that you've come up with on some vendor software, it gives you a path where you first talk to the vendor, and then if the vendor is not being responsive or doesn't handle it in the right way, you can then go public with the vulnerability. And that the community will look at you and say, you did the right thing. And this is a totally non-obvious process, right? Because you release this vulnerability into the wild where people could actually use it to attack that vendor and do who knows what with it. Um, and it really, I think, took a lot of pain and suffering, and you know, I think that there were various people who were sued and attacked for various things uh, along the way to get there. And I think the security world is much better off, and I think we are all more secure because people went through that process. And so I think that you know, I really view what we did as, as a first step towards helping form community norms, and my hope is that they're now starting to fa fall into place. And so I hope that, in fact, people will have a better answer for what they do, and you know, I think that there's We've already developed a few, a few extra norms that I think are helpful, like delayed release or engaging specific partners, and then you can go out together. And I think that those things actually mean that it should just be a less big deal in the future when people have models that are kind of, you know, they're uncertain as to their implications. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I want to end on a slightly more upbeat note. <laughs> um, you both have talked about uh, really interesting developments coming down the pipeline, um, you know. The, the current work that you're doing, but you know what really excites you each personally in the field of AI. Um, you know whether it's like the research within OpenAI or just you know speaking more broadly about um, uh, papers you've seen published on archive. You know, uh, I would just love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So the thing I find most exciting is that deep learning has a lot more potential to go. That if you train larger neural networks, they'll do more. And I hope that we'll get them to solve tasks we can't solve right now. For example, I hope we'll get, be able to make some progress in reasoning as well. That would be quite nice. Yeah, so just train larger networks and harder problems. That's what I'm excited about. Um, so the thing that I'm excited about uh, is something Ilya touched on in, in uh, various ways right there, uh, which is a new team that Ilya and I are leading at OpenAI called the Reasoning Team. And the problem that we want to solve is kind of to some extent, this question that's been around from, from the day one, which was, is it better to go the symbolic systems route or better to go the neural net route? I think the answer is you need both. And uh, I think that we're really excited to actually get neural nets that are capable of reasoning and, uh, and solving tasks they can't today. Yeah, outstanding. Well, I look forward to reading about it soon, I'm sure. <laughs> well, thank you both. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.